So now that we understand a little bit about specific heat, we're going to take a few minutes and talk about how we actually measure heat in chemistry. Remember, we're not measuring with a thermometer that measures temperature. And while they're related, heat and temperature are not the same thing. Here are your learning objectives for this video. Pause the video, write them down if you need to, and come back when you're ready. So before we take a look at the process, uh, we want to understand a term that's very important. It's called enthalpy. And enthalpy is a quantity of heat change for a process, but also it's the direction that that heat is flowing, whether it's flowing into the system or out of the system. We calculate it by the equation delta H, which is the symbol for enthalpy, equals M, which is mass, times C, which is specific heat capacity, times delta T, which is the change in temperature. Now, you should recognize those variables and that relationship because it's one you already know. Delta H has the same value, the same number value, the same size as Q. The only difference now is that delta H will have a sign with it, either positive or negative. And the sign of delta H tells you which direction the heat is flowing. If delta H is positive, that means that this reaction or process is absorbing heat. It's taking heat in. In other words, it's endothermic. And if delta H has a negative sign, then it means that the reaction or process is actually producing heat, or it's exothermic. Now, where delta H gets its sign from has to do with the sign of delta T. And because we always calculate delta T final minus initial, if the final value, the final temperature, is less than the initial temperature, in other words, if the thing is cooling off, well, then it must be releasing heat. And delta T will be negative, and so will delta H. So your sign for delta T determines the sign for delta H. And delta T follows whether or not the thing is cooling off, giving off energy, or if it's heating up, taking in energy. So calorimetry is a process. It's, it's an experiment that we can do that indirectly measures the amount of enthalpy in a system. Now, we can't just stick a thermometer or some other instrument in to measure the heat. So what we do is we use a device called a calorimeter. And it's usually something very simple. You'll see an example of it in just a second. But it's, it's a device that's used to uh, sort of get at the amount of heat in a roundabout fashion. Because we can't, there's no instrument to directly measure the heat. We have to measure the heat when it moves. And different substances respond differently when heated. So we need a standard. And the standard that we use is water. So the simplest type of calorimeter that you're going to encounter is a couple of styrofoam coffee cups, maybe a lid and a thermometer, and something to stir them with. It's a very low-tech setup, but it actually does a pretty good job of, of capturing the heat. Now, the important thing about calorimetry is that we want to standardize, because all different substances react differently to heat, we want to standardize the experiment. And so the easiest thing to do is to use something that's, that's the same in every experiment. So we use water. And water is a good absorber of heat because it's very high specific heat capacity, means that it can absorb a tremendous amount of heat before its temperature changes a whole lot. So it's a good heat sink, and so we use that in our calorimetry experiments. We can use calorimetry then to find changes in enthalpy, delta H. And since Q and delta H are the same, we have the equation already for calculating Q, calculating delta H. We just have to be very conscious now of the sign of delta H. <clears throat> so here's a picture of what a coffee cup calorimeter might look like. We've got a couple of nested coffee cups. Just double the insulation there by putting two of them together. We have a thermometer. We have a, an insulated stopper, but you can use any old cap. A uh, plain old coffee cup cap that you might get at a coffee shop uh, will do. The thermometer kind of goes through there into the solution because we need to measure the temperature. There is a relationship between temperature. And then something with which to stir. Honestly, when I build these things, I just use the thermometer to stir it. It's just easier. So how does it work? Well, here's our calorimeter, and we have our cover, and we have a thermometer, and the stir, and our styrofoam cups. And inside the thermometer, we have some solutions. Now, this particular type of calorimeter can only work with things that are in solution or things that are going to be in water. You're not going to burn anything inside styrofoam cups filled with water. It's just not going to work. If we have two reactants, we put them together. They're in solution, so two solutions. And we were going to react them together to create a chemical reaction. And we put them in there in the calorimeter, and the temperature of the water goes up. 
Well, that means that the water is gaining heat. It's taking heat from the reaction. And that means that the reaction must be losing heat. In other words, the reaction must be exothermic. So how does that work? Well, the energy that the reaction releases causes the water molecules that, they're, that it's sitting in to speed up. And when, when molecules move faster, they have more motion. That means uh, greater kinetic energy. So water is a good thing to absorb the heat. And we can actually measure the change in temperature of water. We also know the specific heat capacity of water. And we can measure the mass of water pretty easily. So we can figure out how much heat the water gained. And then that equates to the amount of heat lost by whatever's happening in the water. So we have to make an assumption. It's very important. We have to assume that the calorimeter doesn't leak energy or absorb energy from itself because that would take away from our value. It's a pretty safe assumption to make with some of this. The error is not all that great. And there are some things we could do to fix it if we, if we really wanted to, but we don't really need to. So the, the important thing to understand then is that the energy that's released by whatever is going on in this calorimeter is, is, is equal to the energy that is absorbed by the water in the solution. And that's the key to, to calorimetry. So here's an example. We have a hot piece of glass. Uh, we've heated it in a flame or something. And we're going to put it into a, co a coffee cup calorimeter. And in that coffee cup calorimeter is 150 grams of 23 degrees Celsius water. So we've got some water in there. We measure the temperature, and it's 23 degrees. We put this hot piece of glass in there. We stir it with a thermometer or with a stirrer, and we watch, and the temperature goes up. Now, it doesn't go up very much, because water can gain a lot of heat before its temperature rises. But it does go up to about 26.5 degrees. So because the temperature of the water increased, we know that the water gained some heat. It took it from the glass. So what we want to do is figure out the enthalpy, the amount of heat that the water gained, and what direction it went in. Well, we know what direction it went in. It went into the water. Uh, and then we also want to figure out the enthalpy for the glass. Well, that's an easy one. So we're going to use our equation. Delta H is equal to M times C times delta T. Delta H is what we're looking for. That's the enthalpy. M is the mass of the water. C is the specific heat capacity of the water. And delta T is the change in temperature of the water. So to calculate the enthalpy of the water, I take 150 grams. That's how much water I had. The specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. And then the change in temperature. Final temperature was 26.5 minus the initial temperature, 23.0. So I get 2,197 joules. That's the amount of heat that the water gained. Well, if you remember, where did it get that heat? It got that heat from the piece of glass. So the enthalpy of the glass is the opposite sign from the enthalpy of the water because the glass lost the heat. It's exothermic. And when it's exothermic, delta H will have a negative value. So delta H for the glass is negative 2,197 joules. So we didn't even have to really measure anything about the glass. We just put it into the water. We did all the calculations about the water. And we got the information about the glass. That's what I mean by an indirect method. It's not directly involving the substance. It's using another substance to help us out. Here's another example. Now, this is a chemical reaction that we're going to have happen inside our calorimeter. We have 50 milliliters of 0.10 molar hydrochloric acid and 50 milliliters of 0.10 molar sodium hydroxide. That's an acid and a base. It's a neutralization reaction. When you do this reaction, it actually produces heat. And we want to figure out how much heat does it produce. So we put this out in a coffee cup calorimeter. The temperature of the resulting solution rises, it goes from 23.5 degrees, that's where it started, to 29.2 degrees. That's the highest temperature reached. Now we have to make some assumptions. The density of this solution is about 1 gram per milliliter, about the same as water. These are fairly dilute solutions. And for dilute solutions, the density doesn't change very much, and neither does the specific heat capacity. This is a mostly water situation, and so the specific heat capacity of this solution is going to be the same as that of water, 4.184. What we're going to calculate is something called the molar enthalpy for this reaction. Not just how much heat this, this specific reaction produced, but how many kilojoules or how many joules per mole of reactants are going to be produced. It's not really that difficult. It's sort of the same process with just one little extra step at the end. So what do we do? First thing we want to do is figure out how much, the wa how much heat the water gained. We know the heat was gained by the water because the temperature of the water went up. So we use our... our Equation again, delta H is equal to M times C times delta T for the water. We had 50 milliliters of one solution plus 50 milliliters of another solution. That's 100 milliliters of solution. 
and the density of that solution is about one gram per milliliter. So we have 100 grams in our calorimeter. It's mostly water, so we use the specific heat capacity of water. The change in temperature, the final temperature of that water, so that solution was 29.2, and its initial temperature is 23.5, so the difference between those is our delta T value. We calculate this to be 2,385 joules. That means that the water in our calorimeter gained that much heat. Notice delta H has a positive sign. It has a positive sign because delta T has a positive sign because it was gaining the heat, endothermic. So, how much heat was lost by the reaction? Well, if the water gained 2,385 joules, then the heat lost by the reaction was it lost 2,385 joules. We just put a negative sign in front of it. Pretty easy, right? So that's how much energy this reaction produced, but this specific reaction. We have 50 milliliters of 0 0.10 molar so, uh, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. I want to know how much energy would be produced if I had exactly one mole of each, because in the balanced equation, it's a one-to-one -one mole ratio. We've got one mole of HCl to one mole of NaOH. So what if I had a whole mole of HCl and a whole mole of NaOH? How much heat would be produced then? Well, first I need to know how many moles of those reaction reactants I actually have. Well, the moles of HCl is equal to the moles of sodium hydroxide because their volumes and concentrations were exactly the same. 50 milliliters, or 0 0.0500 liters, and 0 0.10 moles per liter, 0 0.10 molar. So the number of moles of each reactant is exactly the same, 5.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. Now normally we'd have to consider a limiting a reactant in this but because the number of moles are equal, and it's one to one, there is no limiting reactant. Both reactants get used up. That's convenient. So the molar enthalpy then is the number of joules per mole. Well, I take the number of joules that this reaction produced, which was 2,385, exothermic, which means there's a negative sign. That's not a real negative sign. It's just a directional sign. But I'm going to divide that now by the number of moles of the reactants that I have. There were 5.00 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of either one. It doesn't really matter because there's no limiting reactant. Well, when I do the division, I get the molar enthalpy is negative 477,000 joules per mole. Or if I want to make that a smaller, more manageable number, it's 477,000 or 477 kilojoules per mole. That's the molar enthalpy. That means if I were to do this reaction with one mole of HCl and one mole of sodium hydroxide, I produce 477 kilojoules. Notice I'm not saying the negative sign. But that negative sign just tells me that it's going to come out. It's going to be produced. That's how calorimetry works. Now, what if we want to burn something, though? We want to figure out how much energy is coming out of something that's burning. Well, we can't do it inside water because water puts out fires. There's another way we can do it, and that's what our lab is going to be. So give it a try. Run through it again if you need to. We'll get some practice in class. Good luck.